Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our reading is from Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young, shall, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's end. Then they will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will alternate verses from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son, that he may rule your people righteously and the poor with justice, that the mountains may bring prosperity to the people and the little hills bring righteousness. He shall defend the needy among the people. He shall rescue the poor and crush the oppressor. He shall live as long as the sun and moon endure from one generation to another. He shall come down like rain upon the mown field, like showers that water the earth. In his time shall the righteous flourish. There shall be abundance of peace till the moon shall be no more. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous deeds. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and may all the earth be filled with his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is from Romans 15, 4 through 13. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the, of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locust and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit worthy of repentance, do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I will baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Abide in me, Lord Christ, and I in you. Amen. Please be seated. Every year during the season of Advent, 
a season that we talked about last week has um, specific liturgical practices. So you'll see we have our second candle lit this morning, and you'll see about halfway up the aisle is Mary and Joseph, who have arrived into the building, so to say, and they are making their way up to the front, which is where we will find the baby Jesus on Christmas Eve night. So they have started their journey. And we are journeying with them as in themes of preparation, waiting, and hope, joyful expectation. And as you just heard, here almost always on the second Sunday in Advent, the Sunday right before we get to hear the Song of Mary, the third Sunday when we'll light the pink candle, in case you were wondering about that, is Mary's Sunday, um, to kind of get a little pause from all this fiery preparation that Advent has been bringing us the past two Sundays. Next Sunday, we get a little bit of a break with sweet Mary. So we think, anyway. <laughs> but this week, we have to get through and figure out what in the world is John the Baptist talking about with this particular, peculiar preacher in all of his wildness and splendor, preaching a message of repentance. That's our second Sunday in Advent, and you may think, why in the world is this quite the message of a sweet, preparing, joyful, hopeful Advent? We hear John's voice booming into this Sunday. Repent, make straight the paths, and then he takes on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is where we are today. So how does this message of repentance fit into what, for me, 10, 15 years ago, was a little bit uncomfortable to have this blazing, blaring voice into my joyful preparation of receiving the, the gift of the Christ child on Advent, in Advent. So why is John there? He's there for a reason, and I don't think we want to miss the point. I think, though, lest we be, or at least for me, sort of um, distracted by the strong images and the, the worrisome pieces that could come up from that, I think John the Baptist actually, in this sense, is offering a message an, of invitation, one that... Um, might be a little loud and a little sort of John-esque in its um, persona, but that's John the Baptist. That's who we have. And um, it confused, I think, some of the early followers of Christ and those around in the area where Jesus was moving, we're told historically. Some of them didn't quite know what to make of John the Baptist either. So if that's where you are this morning, that's okay. You're not alone in this. I do have some thoughts, though, about how to understand John's message of repentance and the fire that comes along with him. I will say that a traditional understanding of John of repentance comes from the fourth century St. Augustine, which looks at who we are as created in the image of God and yet utterly broken and not one easily repaired, if at all. So unworthy, helpless, brokenness from our birth. That is how Augustine would look at this particular uh, understanding and story of um, John the Baptist. I think there's another understanding, though, that comes from a similar time frame as the ancient father Augustine, and it is a little different understanding of who, um, how we look at the humanity that John is talking to us about. And it's not one that's broken and unworthy. Pelagian view, Pelagius would say, no, it's good. There's good buried deep down in there. And we are being called to actively participate with God in bringing forth like that essence of who we are and uncovering it and restoring it. And so I think when I look at those two ways of hearing this invitation of John, I hear John's uh, more of God having a longing for us to step into the fire with God and discover all that has been, is, and will be created with us and God working together to discover and bring about all that goodness. It's not really a hellfire sort of fire that you could think about. I think the fire that John is talking about in our gospel today is a fire of redemption, of recreation, if you will. It's a fire that clears away all the clouds that, and covers the goodness 
that is within each of us. And so John, I think, rightly is telling, as I told you, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the typical ways of worshiping God, knowing the right readings, wearing the right vestments, lighting the right candles, those things alone don't really fully bring us there. That if those are the things that have become the focus of worship instead of seeking the, the path that God has laid before them, and uncovering that and recognizing the grace that is there and the, the essence of love that is within each of us, that we are to align those things and bring about the full image of God within us. I think that's John's invitation is to burn away all of that stuff that is kind of getting in the way of letting that goodness come forth. Now, I have an image that I use with this, and I've shared this with a few of you all before, so if you've heard this before, I apologize. However, I think it's okay to hear images and stories more than once. We do that in our lectionary every three years, right? We hear similar, the same readings every three years. And this story is one that I tell again, um, because some of you haven't heard it, and others, I, I always find there's a deeper place that I can go with it. Um, and for me, it really helps me understand what stepping into the fire can be like. And I think that's what John is asking us to do to fully prepare for Jesus. So you've heard me talk about this before. It's about 20, 25 years. I uh, began going to uh, uh, Whirlwind Mission of the Holy Family. Uh, in Watonga, and it was a cross-cultural exchange. We went this past summer. It's about our 25th or 26th year, and we go to teach for three days and to share because it's a mutual. It works both ways. We offer and we receive from those who are up there in that community as well. They host us, and we bring things to them, and I can tell you I would not be standing here right now before you if I hadn't have had those early experiences when I was in high school uh, at Whirlwind Indian Mission in Watonga, which is a part of what you all support in the Diocese of Oklahoma. So we would have children that would come in the morning into the afternoon for about 50 kids or so for three days. And um, we would work with them and learn from them and uh, spend time together. And then in the afternoons and the evenings, we would have youth and adults from that community who would go out and take us to visit various tribal leaders or museums, uh, important sites along the way. And um, over the years and decades, clearly it has shaped me um, into who I am, but there's a lot of other youth and kids and adults who could come up and share this same story with you all as well who've been there over the years. So in the midst of that learning, and um, it's sort of a place where you go and you don't exactly know what time everything's gonna start and exactly how everything's gonna happen. You just go with the flow, all right? And so I think there is a sense of um, learning and openness that is in that experience of showing up at a place and being willing to see where you are taken and what arrives. And so one of my favorite things that we um, traditionally have done there over the years is one of the elder tribal members would host a sweat lodge for us, which is not a typical experience that an Anglo person like me would typically get to have. Um, but because we were there with these friends and we had developed a relationship with them, we had the gift of receiving this experience. Uh, I was maybe a little older than you all, maybe in like early high school, but we soon had little kids of older brothers and sisters who would start showing up and they would say, well, my brother and sister's there, I should be at this place too. And so we sort of had these generations who would come up and have this experience like I'm talking to you about. So for a sweat lodge, which is a traditional way of worshiping um, and cleansing in the Cheyenne Arapaho um, culture, um, you would go in the evening and they would be preparing this experience for you, this worship, uh, all day long because they had um, uh, what was like a turtle shell and it was covered, it was completely dark. And in the middle is about a round area dug out in the middle of this dome, turtle dome, that you would all go in and sit in. And they had taken the middle part, they dug it out, put it outside by the door, and that was the altar. 
And so you would recognize the sacred place that you were coming in. You would find your way in. You would sit down. You would receive sort of some instruction. This is, um, you have to know how to do this. And the uh, tribal elders have done this for decades and decades and decades. And so they can do it in a safe way. And yet it is a bit risky because you go and you sit in the dark and you have these rocks that have been burning in a fire the entire day right outside the door, right next to the altar mound, and they would start putting these rocks, they're called grandfathers, and they would load them into the middle pit, and it would get hot, 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 hot. And you would offer your prayers, and you would put the medicine on, and you would hear the history, you would be invited in to pray, they would close the door, and they, you would sit there, and you would see these rocks just glowing and sparkling in the darkness. And then they would pour the water, and the steam would come up, and you would pray, and you would drum, and you would listen to how uh, this particular way of connecting with the higher power was for these people gathered on this night. And you would pray, and you would sing, and you would drum. You would open the door, you would go out, <laughs> you would catch your breath. Sometimes you would stay in the, the, um, in, the air, in, the, uh, in the turtle, in the structure, in the lodge. And then they would come and add more rocks, add more rocks. And you would watch, and they would grow, and they would be glowing and sparkling. And then shut the door, you would pray, add water, more, more uh, steam, more sweat. Four times. Four times you would go through this generally. So the rocks would grow and grow and grow and grow, right? And you would just be sitting there offering your prayers, and they would drop these rocks in, and sometimes they'd break in half. Sometimes pieces of them would crack off. But they would just keep adding more and more and more. And they would pour the water, and it would sparkle, and then they would steam, and somehow, after the fourth round, you had made it through. You'd had an experience. Sometimes we were told people had visions there. I, I never had a vision. But I can tell you there was something beyond me that was within that whole process and sharing that together and having that gift offered by the people who hosted us that entire week, year after year after year. And those grandfather rocks would grow, and they would sparkle, and they would remind me of the beauty of what can happen when you step into the fire and leave pieces of yourself behind that are less true and not of God, and they would fall away. Metaphorically, the rocks are there, or even, ultimately, yourself, and then your goodness can shine forth. It's a scary thing to step into the fire, into the unknown, into the dangerous, to relinquish control, to leave behind the familiar and venture into the promised place that is unfamiliar. I have to allow parts of my presumed worldly identity to be cast away, to be consumed in the fire, and to discover that their replacements are a compelling vi vision of God's hopes for me that result in a far different place, oftentimes, than I had pictured for my life. I think that's where we are at St. Andrews right now, sort of gathering who we are, who is the essence of who we are, and where is God out in the world working already in Southwest Oklahoma, and where do we need to join in for that? It will mean leaving the familiar behind. It'll also be taking some beautiful pieces along with us on that journey to incorporate into what we'll become. And it is scary, and yet here it is. It's really not, because Christ is already with me and in me and in you walking each step of the way. And when it seems like I can't take any more that I have been in the fire long enough, I remind myself of all the other people who have walked through this fire with me, and I know where to find them. I know where to find you, and we can make it together.
This, my beloved friends, is what Advent is to me anyway, a time to set aside to prepare our hearts. Say I didn't, didn't say minds and hearts. We might start here. We have to get here. We are preparing our hearts for the coming of God and Christ who is going to live and love and dwell among us and walk with us and take us down these paths that we have not been down perhaps before. It's a time this Advent season to open our hearts to the unquenchable fire of God that brings life from such a flame and a fire that can be fanned and then we can be consumed and then we can be allowed to sparkle and shine forth so the darkness does not overcome it. This Advent season, may you accept John the Baptist invitation. It's an invitation. It doesn't, it's not a scary one. Sometimes when I read John the Baptist, he scares me. But if I can look underneath, what John the Baptist is really saying is, get yourself ready. Here is my invitation. Offer your best self, your soul, and your body to greet the Holy One that we know is soon to be among us. And when we can do that, and we can do that together, we will find a peace that passes such understanding. It'll almost be counterintuitive, and yet it'll be so sweet, we will know that it is real. I think that is the magnitude of the incarnation when we can let it sink into our hearts and into our souls that can fuel us to continue doing God's work this day and in the Christmas season and in the season after Christmas and into Lent and on and on and on. May that fire be the fire that, yes, it consumes you, but that it also fuels you. May we please rise as we reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishop, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the hungry, the, the oppressed, those in prison, and the sick, especially Al, Bill, Bob, Bobby, Candy, Caroline, Dave, David, Evelyn, Helen, 
Jabes, Jason, Jean, Joe, Jude, Catherine, Laverne, Lucille, Luke, Paisley, Paisley H, Pat Y, Rose, Russ, Ride Family, Sherry, and Wade. Pray for those in any need or trouble. For Jane, for those who suffer with addiction. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Stephen Bentley. Pray, pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for those who serve in the military. I ask your thanksgiving for all the blessings of this life and all those who are celebrating birthdays, especially Pat Henry. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, Mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please kneel as we confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all our sin, your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise. Uh-oh. Oh, my goodness. All right. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. Here, would you, would you like the big important one? <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> God's peace. Are, you, are we shaking hands, or are you feeling well? Be seated. Have I met you before? Okay, I was just, thank you. Be seated. Have a, have a, I was just checking. All right, God's peace. Um, we do have a couple of announcements. Uh, at after worship, I have kids going with me and a few parents, I believe, who can drive. We are headed to Walmart. We're gonna get a quick lunch and then head to Walmart. Um, we are shopping for the angel tree on Sheridan, which is where we will also be dropping our gifts off as well for the angel tree. We have several members at St. Andrews who have been involved with angel tree and Salvation Army Ministries over the years. Uh, Ann Friedel, I know you're involved right now. Yes, I know Nan Mazza. Is there anyone else? Raise your hand if we have um, anyone else that's involved. I know there's a good couple of people. Um, so, Sue, yes. Have you been down there helping, Judy? Okay. So it's a long time uh, uh, um, ministry that people have uh, been involved with uh, Salvation Army over the years. So uh, find me afterwards, kids. We are, we are going for lunch. And then a quick shopping trip, we have three kiddos that we're uh, purchasing for, and we have lists. However, I will need your help, because I'm not a kid, right? Right, yes, yeah, you're on it. Okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so with that, um, 
We, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who helped make Stephen Bentley's funeral here this past Thursday. Uh, it went as so well. Uh, it was wonderful to be able to um, open our uh, doors in a way that we haven't really been able to open them as much since COVID and I arrived three years ago. So this was uh, a, a large funeral for us and um, took a lot of hands to make it happen. So thank you. Um, and with that, I would, uh, s did you have it? Oh, thank you. Yes, two, I have two spots. Bell Ringing Salvation Army this Thursday. If you would like to sign up, there's an 11 and a 12 o'clock spot back there that we need help with. Everything else from 10 to 6 has been covered. So, well done, well done. Uh, thank you. And the weather actually looks to be pretty reasonable this Thursday, so we got lucky there. Um, I think that's everything. So, um, let us ascribe in the Lord the honor due God's name, bring offerings, and come into God's courts.
All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Before we begin our Eucharist, please, Lane, you can be seated. You can be seated. I just wanted to do a, a quick teaching uh, to tell you all that you noticed I filled this with wine, and you may be going, well, I don't typically see this thing on the altar. <laughs> it was important that you all know this is our reserve communion, which we keep here, which the red light never goes out except for Monday, Thursday. It is moved with the reserve sacraments. So this is a sign of God's Christ's presence that's always available. It's connected back to our Jewish roots on the day the tabernacle oil ran out, and yet, even when it was destroyed, the light still burned on the menorah. So, this is where we keep the reserve sacraments. We were out of wine, um, and it didn't taste very good. So, we replaced it, uh, because we would be going out to, to give communion here over the holiday season. And I wanted you all to know that it comes from the one cruet, the one cup, the one blood, the one, everything, the connection that we have all together from the one cup, and that it is poured into here and shared in this way as well. But it's an important theological piece from an Episcopal uh, Anglican perspective, is the unity that we all share because we have the one cup and the one bread that are there. Today you'll see this, but it's all from the same place, and that's why it's there, and we will bless it and you all will help me bless it with your presence. So, a little Episcopal teaching, historical lesson for you all so that you aren't going, what is that thing up there on the altar? There you are, that's what it is. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought forth all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Stand, sit, or kneel as is meaningful for you. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless to his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me.
as supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is, shed for, which is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer you our gifts of bread and of wine and ourselves, a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your, whole, breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. And in the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. As we are receiving communion today, you will notice we have a different communion hymn than we typically have in our rotation. Uh, it's one we're going to be learning for Advent. It's a, uh, the theology and the images are beautiful. Um, it's rather contemplative, fits in with the space we're in for this Advent season. So have your bulletins ready, listen to it, try it out, experience it, and we'll have it the next few Sundays as well. So thank you. body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Christ our God to earth descended, our full homage to demand. King of kings, let born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood. Lord of lords in human vesture, in the body and the blood, he will give to all the faith. own self our heavenly food. Rank on rank the host of heaven spreads its vanguard on the As the light of light descended from the realms of endless day, that the powers of hell may vanquish as the darkness clears away. At his feet the six-winged seraph, cherubim with sleepless eye, veil their faces to the presence, as with ceaseless voice they cry. Alleluia, Alleluia, Lord Most High. Let our mortal flesh keep silence. And with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descendeth our full homage to demand. King of kings yet born of Mary as of old on earth he of lords in human vesture, in the body and the blood, that the powers of hell may vanquish all the On rank the host of heaven spreads its vanguard on the way as the light of light descended from the realms of endless day that the of hell may vanquish as
as the darkness clears away. At his feet the six wing seraph, cherubim with sleepless eyes, veil their faces to the presence as with ceaseless voice they cry. Alleluia, 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 Lord Most Continuing together, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May it be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.